This session we're going to take, I think, a really important uh, turn. It's going to be focused around on-farm, the people that are critical as this whole part of what we do in the, in the space. And so to um, start this session, um, we've got uh, Lauren Finger is going to be joining us on the podium here up at the stage and provide us with a view from the paddock. Lauren is a dairy farmer from Gippsland. Lauren and her husband Simon have followed the traditional path from share farming to leasing and then following in a non-traditional way from leasing to farm ownership, running one, two and three farms, milking once, twice and even three times a day. In 2020, they moved away from synthetic fertilisers to multi-species pasture and a new dairy was commissioned in 2022. The herd is what has made it all possible, and the cows continue to be a key focus on their journey. I'd like you to welcome Lauren to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham. I thought uh, if I start with the view from the paddock, I've met my brief. And so this is our herd uh, about a month ago on a nice summer's evening. You'll see uh, a bit of variety in there. Um, Multicoloured herd. I always forget to do the basic important bits that give you an idea of who we are and where we are. We're just southeast of Melbourne. They're quite quite close in, only 88 k's from the centre of Melbourne on the edge of the Career Up Swamp. We have about a 190 hectare milking platform, 550 odd cows, mostly spring calving. Um, we breed two Frisian. Um, but we do have a herd with Frisian, Frisian Cross and some Jersey. Production figures are there. Uh, we have six employees, three full-time, two part-time, one casual. We've used collars since 2019. And as Graham mentioned, we, we commissioned a new dairy in June of 2022, uh, which is a 50-unit rotary dairy. We're, um, we're a hard farm to put in a box, so I thought I'd... Um, give you a little bit of help. Um, we're probably more towards the business side of farming more so than lifestyle. Um, it's not the only consideration, but we certainly do always strive to understand that every decision we make on farm will have a business and financial impact. We're pretty well up there on aiming for best practice. We certainly make sure we always know what best practice is, but every farm system has compromises. This is the one where we try and be off the scale. And uh, given that our theme is sustainability, I, I couldn't not talk a little bit about how we view people um, because people are a key part of the sustainability of our farm. Low stress stock handling is a key pillar that we build our farm system on. We give our people autonomy. We try and teach them the why of what we do. Um, we do end up fixing some repairs and breakages as a result, but the job satisfaction that we get from our people is, that we, we think outweighs those things. Many years ago, we sat down with our team and we actually did an exercise where we worked out our business values and we've stuck with them ever since. Uh, we've been pretty happy that they work for us and what we do. Business values are nothing without behaviour statements to go with them. Um, so in respect, we talk about respect for the people, the cows, the contractors that work for us, the environment and ourselves. We're no good to anyone if we don't look after ourselves. We say that nobody's better than anyone else, but we all have different skills and everybody's got something to offer. So me paying the bills or making big business decisions is no better than the person that milks the cows every day. It's just a different part of the business. Cooperative spirit. Treat people as you'd like to be treated and leave things as you'd like to find them. I'm sure anyone who has staff would know that that's a, that's a constant challenge. And create a win-win situation wherever we can. Continuous improvement. This is one that... Um, we certainly brought into our recruitment focus more, so things going wrong is every day on a farm. Um, so we really actually look to find people who can cope with that. I mean, every day is a new day, so find opportunities to make tomorrow better. And we try and have simple systems and do them well. 
This is our team. The best way to get permission to uh, put people up on screen is to uh, have a picture of their backs. That's uh, the go line of the Easter egg hunt, and we've done that for a few years now. Um, this is a few years ago. We've got backpackers from Japan, Chile, Denmark, and UK in that picture. One of them's come back to us. We're currently sponsoring her to obtain a permanent visa. Diversity is really important to us, and um, dairy experience certainly isn't a prerequisite. We actually really appreciate the innovation that comes from getting outside points of view. So we're very much higher to our, to our values, and it's working well for us. This is the one that makes us hard to put in a box. So when I, how many cows do you milk is always a very different, difficult question for me to answer. And I say that the right number of cows for our farm with our new dairy is between four and 700. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, we've milked once, twice, three times a day, did 10 and seven for about six weeks, served a purpose, um, run one, two, three farms. We've fed two kilos of grain, we've fed 13 kilos of grain. We've never quite milked at seven cows to the hectare and we never quite put 700 cows through an old 250 cow dairy. Um, but I am married to a wonderful man who loves to push the boundaries. Um, and I actually found in a book I was reading recently a, a term that I thought described it pretty well, which was highly responsive real-time farming. And this person was trying to describe where, where she thought farming needed to get to in the future to be sustainable and... I thought, yep, that sounds like us. Facilities on farm, so part of the reason we've, we've had to be so good with, with culture and behaviour and recruitment is because we've had very poor facilities on our farm. So um, coming back from two farms to one farm about 18 months ago has allowed us to invest in new infrastructure. And um, this is probably a little bit of a busy slide, hopefully you can see it, but you'll see there's a real mix of old and new. So at the top you can see a new dairy, a new hay shed, the little old dairies in the background. And in the foreground is the, uh, the bit of wood chips and shade cloth, um, which when we were running multiple farms we carved over a thousand cows a year on that little bit of wood chip and shade cloth. And the baby calf shed still gets way too crowded. So the investment in infrastructure Again, key part of sustainability. Livestock is definitely what we do, though. Um, and our farm income, and I've got uh, colleagues who are in our discussion group who will know this, that um, our farm income has been a significant component of livestock over that time. And that's figures from 10 years. So the highest figure there is actually over 50% when we downsize from two herds to one. And... Um, over the 10 years, it's been 20% of our farm income. So the milk's, the milk's made it all possible, but I would have no doubt that the livestock's what's built us a new dairy. And you guys are all cow people here, so you know this equation. This is the magic equation. Um, one plus one makes three. And that's, that's the, been one of the keys to our success. We view our cows a little bit like shares, and I probably came from a, a background of loving the data and the genetics and the cows, and I've had, to, um, I've had to adapt over time, and I've got no doubt that we probably wouldn't be where we are if we had not done this. So we try and buy or keep a cow that's good value, and I want to thank Dale Hanks at the Australian Dairy Conference for the term black jelly beans, which I don't know if any of you have ever heard that before. But our herd is absolutely built on black jelly beans, which are the ones that are left. Um, and we try and sell at high value. So it is not a good thing to be a very large, fat Frisian cow doing a small amount of milk around our place. Um, and export heifers is the other one that's, that's been um, very good for us over the years. So I figure I've got people in the room who like data, so I thought I would back it up and say there are real figures since I've been on um, electronic accounting that's the quantity, you know, we've sold 1,688 dairy heifers and 2,200 odd cows, 2,600 calves. And I felt really exhausted um, just looking at that. Um, but yeah, no doubt it's been important to what we've done. But how did we get here? So that is me with my grandfather. My grandfather was a 10 pound pom. He was actually a very early no till. Uh, adopter, and that's up in northeast Victoria. So I had the opportunity to grow up in the city, go to a great school, 
And it was probably about grade three when I came home with this. Um, and my parents went, oh, no, don't do that. And uh, they said, go and be a vet. So I put that up there just so you know the context from which I am speaking. I did go through and become a vet. But these things have a way of sorting themselves out. And here we are. So the little one loves to remind me that she is extra. She wasn't part of the plan, but she's gorgeous. So that photo is a few years old now. Um, that's our family. This is not my ryegrass. Uh, it's beautiful. I haven't really got anything that looks like this anymore. Um, in 2020, we um, went to the Australian Dairy Conference and heard the term hollow food. So this coincided with a wet summer for us in Gippsland and we kept on putting on the fertiliser, as you do, behind the cows. And by that autumn, in early 2020, it felt like everything was a bit radioactive, so we killed a few cows with everything, even frothy bloat, for goodness sake. Um, and I started putting it all together, and it was a bit of a light bulb moment in connecting the dots. And in that previous fin that financial year, we put on over a tonne to the hectare of urea, and it just felt like something... The, the ground was getting harder, the rain wasn't going in, and it just felt like something needed to change. So we did, and I've put these in here just because if you do get the slides, you might be interested. I know some of you do a lot of driving in cars, um, listening to podcasts, reading books. Um, the one in the middle is a great book if you only read one. It's a really interesting read and it'll refer you off to everything else you might want to know. And we started looking into what is controversially called regenerative agriculture. Um, it's not the greatest term because it implies that the opportunity is degenerative but looking at more how, how nature functions and what could we take out of that to actually make things better on our farm. So Charles Massey in the middle, he talks about five key landscape functions. So he talks about the solar cycle, the water cycle, the soil mineral cycle, the ecosystem of the animals and the plants, and then the human social side of it. And that I think that addition of the human social is really important um, and we can't ignore it. But what I want you to take from that picture is that they're all connected. Every single one of those things is connected to each other and in a nice, really balanced, regular shape. You hear about the five principles of soil health, so limited disturbance, keep cover on the soil, have diversity, have living roots, integrate animals. So as a dairy farm, we have a massive advantage in wanting to go down this path that we've got animals integrated and they graze intensively. So it's been, it's, they haven't been able to mimic anything like that when they're doing crops. And so in the spring of 2020, um, off we went. So this is the soil key machine. It's a strip tiller, so it sows a diverse cover crop um, in, in a strip till about so wide. And we actually haven't used artificial fertiliser since. So that's an example of the crop. And this is our soil, so that's an early picture from when we started, so we have a quite heavy clay. Um, you can see in the middle the quite compacted area and on the side in that strip where it's starting to aggregate and it's, it's actually quite diversely or aggregated now a couple of years in. Um, I had Simon actually ring me with excitement. I've got great news when I was driving on the way here and I thought, oh, you know, what's that? Well, the irrigator got stuck, the effluent irrigator, and we had this big flood yesterday. And I went back there and I dug today and it was all gone. And I dug down two foot and the moisture was all down and it was diverse and you couldn't even tell it had been there. And he was so excited to, to tell me that. So uh, we've got some, just some of the things that we look at. That's the seed mix in the middle, just to give you an idea. Um, so cereals, peas, vetch, clover, chicory, plantain, um, grasses as well. We look for nodules with the nitrogen fixes. We look for the mycorrhizal fungi on the roots. These are the sort of things that we start looking at now and our shovel's probably our favourite tool. This is a summer pasture. Um, and these are our springborn calves. So that picture was taken about a month ago. Um, if you look at the calves, you'll see they're healthy, they're shiny, they've never been drenched. Um, the previous year's spring calves have never been drenched either. Uh, actually, not because we wouldn't drench them, just because they haven't needed it. But look at the foreground. Isn't it a mess? So probably the, the biggest thing that I've found with this is this takes courage to actually have a paddock that looks like that 
and know that that's good for the soil and it's good for the animals, but the neighbours don't think much of it. So this sunflowers are wonderful. You plant them on, along the boundary and they're, they're so cheerful at this time of year, but they do stir up the neighbours. And I think this is a really important barrier to doing this kind of thing. And this saying here comes from, from Gabe Brown, quotes it, if you want to make small changes, change how you do things. If you want to make big changes, you have to change how you see things. So when you see those big tall docks in the paddock and it looks ugly and the seeds are on top, you can see a mess and you can see a bad farmer that can't control their weeds, or you can actually see a plant that has a deep taproot that mines the micronutrients and the cows that walk in the paddock and nibbling the seeds off those docks is actually the first thing that you do. So it hasn't been all beer and skittles for us by any means. Um, when you rely on photosynthesis and you get no sun, is a bit of a problem. Too many feet has definitely been an issue, I think, in our ecosystem. And then, of course, there's, there's a human factor. Um, so it's a learning journey for us. We, we've tried every seed drill under the sun. Um, we've been broadcasting with a truck. We've now got a drone to broadcast the seed. We've had really mixed results. It's been, it's been tough seasons in our part of the world, and we, we still haven't got a crop as good as that very first year just because we haven't had spring. If you've got five minutes and you haven't listened to Simon Sinek's Find Your Why, it's a great little piece of um, YouTube to listen to, and it's a hard thing to do. But this sentence is the best I can come up with at the moment, which is that we actually enjoy working with nature, not against it. So some of the goals of what we're trying to do, decreased outputs, plus or minus, decreased inputs, plus or minus increased outputs should give us greater resilience. The big one for us, we have no irrigation, is to harvest and utilise the available rainfall. So we would always traditionally have the first few rains in autumn do nothing um, before the grass would start to grow and then the minute it dried up, it would stop. And already we're actually seeing a significant change to that ability to infiltrate moisture and that's our number one goal in what we're doing. Um, Maximise homegrown feed, still a work in progress, get the nutrients from natural cycles and of course have animals to fit the system. So you can see I'm really good at maths. Um, I was pretty good at vet schoolers too. Um, and vitamin F and vitamin G are really, really important to what we do. And they're the big unspoken ones, I think, and so important. So I was thinking, you know, some of our philosophies around what we do, F for food and G for green grazed feed. So food will outdo everything. And there's something magic in green. I don't know, Carl, you might know more about what it is, but they just always do that bit better when there's something green for them to graze. Big focus on preventative health, and that's probably my training as a vet. So we use vaccines, we manage our colostrum, including preservative, and every calf gets tube fed. We use teat seal, dry cow, lead feed with excellent. So we try and do all that stuff really well. Great ID and data, um, low stress stock handling. Not really into high intervention cedars, synchro. Um, and not really into high maintenance cows, so try and try and do a lot of selection. New to genomics, um, I've been part of Michelle's calf vitality project for um, two years now. Still trying to work in where that fits in our system. Uh, so that's our stats from 20. I'm just bragging really because it was great. Um, we had a really good spring calving. We had a quite an experienced team. Um, and I think, you know, these stats, that's genetic improvement, selection pressure and preventative health working together. So it's what you're doing with genetics, genomics, and it's what I'm doing on farm to select the right cow for my system and preventative health. Couldn't resist putting up a graph. Um, that's, again, that's the trend over time. So as we've got the collars, we've got an increase in calf value, we've got a decrease in the percentage of dairy bull calves. We did buy in some cows, but if we'd only calved our own cows, that would have been 8%. And, um, and less stillbirths, which is fabulous, their calf. And that's not from more attention. We used to check, you know, five years ago, we'd be up in the night every two or three hours, and we don't do that anymore. Uh, this is my mind map that I came up with of what we do when you're trying to explain what, what is a farm ecosystem, and it all starts with healthy soil. So we're trying to have healthy soil, growing a mixed forage to feed a healthy cow. Has a healthy calf, 
comes a dairy replacement or a beef animal, and obviously the byproducts of the cow are the meat and the milk. All starts with the soil. The color, this is where I can exert selection pressure. So my job as the farmer is to put selection pressure on my herd, and the collars have allowed us to do that. That's been a game changer for us, that you don't actually have to colour cow to stop her getting pregnant or to choose who she gets joined to. So removing bulls from our system has allowed us to select animals without having to remove them from the herd. Um, we've had no need for genomics because I've basically sold my selection criteria down there is white feet. And we've been very fortunate to be able to do that. So that's why we haven't gone there yet. And it's probably just been the luxury of a couple of good seasons and Michelle's very convincing invitation to her project that's, um, that's allowed me to dip my toe in the water and starting to have a look at it. So genomics comes in here, but I'm really interested in epigenetics as well. So I've looked at the genomic figures. I'm, I'm not going to tell you guys anything about it um, that you would probably teach me a lot, you, lot more. But my top BPI cow last year came from a three-tit cow. Um, this year, one of the top cows came from a cow that can't walk because her hips are so bad. Um, so I'm still learning and I'm still, I know I've got to trust the data and I know it's about herd things, but I've, um, I've long selected cows on their, their survivability in our herd. And I'm really interested as those genomically tested calves carve in to actually see how they perform. So the epigenetics is an interesting one. There's fantastic data around in utero heat stress and also the amount of milk that gets fed in the first 30 days. And we've actually seen both of those things in action on our farm. So we've had beautiful autumn carved, autumn born heifers come in and be this tall and look magnificent with no milk. And we've also um, had calves, we used to get our calves contract reared where they were probably reared for survival rather than production. So now the actions we've taken on our farm, our autumn, joint, our autumn cows are few and they get all joined to beef. And we also feed our calves milk twice a day for the first four weeks, which takes a lot of effort, but we think the effort is worth it. <coughs> Pardon me. We've tried poor quality milk replacer and worked out that is not cheaper at all. That was terrible. Um, so I'm interested, you know, the epigenetics, that stuff's heritable. And for those who are out there researching and involved in this industry, I'm, I'm interested in how those effects interact with the genomics. So what's, if I, put a great epigenetic effect over my, my calf by feeding it great milk coming from a really well-nourished cow, how does that interact with the genomic figure compared to a, another, you know, that's, that's something that interests me. So this would not be, we've seen a beautiful cow. Tim, your cow was beautiful. Oh, I'm putting up my shameful cows. This is Bendy Legs, she's gorgeous. I cursed her, I put her here and she went two weeks ago because of mastitis, 11 years old. She'd never been lame. She carved every year. Straight two digits on the cell count. That's a pretty respectable PI for a Jersey cow in a Frisian herd. Aren't those legs great? <coughs> and this one, I, I would title this photo from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, none of those cows have given us a reason to remove them from the herd at this point. Um, so they've, they've fit our system. So it does, it challenges me because I like to breed a good looking cow. Um, but we also, we, we know our reasons why the cows leave our herd and we do allow cows that fit our system to stay. So I couldn't resist ending here. Bar Barry gave me a great um, lead in, I guess. Um, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? And we can't keep going the way we are, clearly. But I think it's fantastic that we are part of agriculture and agriculture feeds the world, and agriculture as custodians of the land around us, we've actually can do something, and we can do something positive. So I'm looking forward to the day where we move past, dare I say, methane and carbon, and get towards biodiversity and circular economy and those sort of things where ag agriculture can be seen as part of the solution. So hopefully that's been interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, is there, I've lost Slido, so um, 
sure I told him not to distract me with any questions. Oh, so okay then. Well, I did what you said. Yeah, thank you. Uh, pretty good. So, is there any questions for for Lauren? No, I think we're um, through the lights and nothing coming up on Sido. But thank you so much for sharing that journey. And I think the the part about it is whether everyone wants that journey. But I think the questioning and looking at what you do and not necessarily having to be the same over the the fence every time and be prepared to to do that and the outcome. So fantastic for you taking that on. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.